the believers that are there today are not going to know where the older generation, the Abrahams and the beginners of our faith, the early church, where did they get their sustenance? Where are the wells? Where they drank from? Because most of this, the enemy has been clogging and covering up and filling with that. And the enemy slowly has been blocking the places where you can find sustenance. And these wells are the ones I pray that God is going to help us so that they can remain open for the generations that are coming. What they were after was for Isaac to be discouraged and to stop digging wells, but he just kept digging. The man could not be discouraged by accusations. And many, many people that have been successful in life are those that have been able to stood in the midst of false accusations and stood their ground. Can you imagine someone like Joseph? who is accused of raping somebody. And this woman had evidence. She had a jacket. Yet Joseph knew that she's the one who wanted to do evil with him. And yet, being falsely accused, he still went through it and became the prince of Egypt. And I pray that those of you that are in Rehoboth are going to arise and go to Beersheba and you're going to hear the voice of the Lord again reassure you and say that I am your God and I will be with you. Do not fear. I'm going to stand with you. And that one tells you that even in the midst of voices and noises that are being spoken every day, that God is going to be with you. He says, do not fear. That means settle in this land. Start digging again. Because in this land, I'm going to bless you. Then Abraham settled. And um, among his journeys, he had dug some wells. If you go back to Genesis 21, you'll find... He came to a place in Geral, and when he got to Geral, it's a desert place, he started digging wells. God gave him this wisdom, that when you are in the desert, you can, dig, you can go down. How he found the science to even know where the water table is and where you can dig and find water, nobody knows. But this man knew that underneath this dry soil you see here in the desert, there is water. God gave him that wisdom. And so... He started digging and he dug wells. And when he dug wells, the Philistines came and fought with him. And he made them swear an oath before the Lord. And he said, and he gave them use. And uh, he said, this is a sign, seven of them. And he said, this is a sign that I bought this land and that this well belongs to me. And there was an agreement between him and the king of Gerar at that time. And he also had come with his commander and they had come uh, to make a treaty with him. He dies and his son Isaac, a very timid young man, takes over the whole estate of his father. And when he begins uh, his journeys, he is in Gerar and he is in this dry place. And so I'll read from there that Isaac was a wealthy man. And in verse 14, we are told he had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. You know, when you start having wealth and things, people start envying you. People love you very much when there is nothing going on in your life because you are not a threat to them. But when you start having something, then they don't, they don't compare favorably to you. And if they are very insecure, they start envying your life. They envied him. And so all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father, Abraham, the Philistines stopped up and filled the mouth up. So they came and put that inside of those they put mud inside of those wells, and then they stopped them and covered those wells. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, verse 16, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. Verse 17, so Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar, where he settled. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, and which the Philistines had stopped after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac Isaac's servant dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerald quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. They came over and said, well, the well may be yours. You may be the one who dug, but the water under our feet is our water. So they came and argued and they just talked back and forth. And they disputed. Then they dug another well. That is verse 21. Another well. But they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well. And no one quarreled over, over it. He named it Lehoboth saying, 
Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God of your father Abraham. Anytime you see one of the patriarchs has, have an appearance from the Lord, it is important for you to know why. And why does the Bible insist and say that the same night, the same night, what happened during the day? What happened at that time that provoked God to manifest and show up? Because those are the significant things that are very important as you study and as you want to know God more for your life. So he said, well, and, and, and now the Lord has given us room. We will flourish in the land. From there he went to Beersheba that night. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent and there the servants dug a well. So you see he has come to another place and he builds an altar. And this is the same thing that I've read in the story of Abraham over and over. Wherever he went, he built an altar, but he pitched a tent. The altar of the Lord, he built well, established it. But for his own dwelling, he actually just pitched a tent. And that shows his priority. That shows how important he put the house of God and worship. He made a tent for himself, but he wanted even after he leaves, the mark of where God spoke to him was always left there. And that's why he talks about he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, but he pitched a tent. His tent there and the servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with uh, Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and Fikol, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, why have you come to see me? Since you are hostile to me and sent me away. This is Isaac, I understand him when he asks people like this. This is normal language. Talk, people, uh, talk to you and they've been fighting you all along. And you ask them, why now? You know? But God changes him a little bit and they answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. We have seen the Lord is with you. There ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you. Now, these are the same guys who said, you're too strong, go away. They're not saying, no, <laughs> you, are, you are not alone. And we don't want God to come back with you. And fight against us, so we want to make a that you will also you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well, did they, and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank early in the morning. The men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. And it says again here, and I want you to mark this. That day, that same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, we found water. He called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been called Beersheba. Amen? And if you are studious and you love reading the Bible, actually you go back to Genesis 21, it reads exactly the same. Actually, Abraham had come back to the place and Abraham had called it Sheba, and Abraham had dug a well, and they had come and made peace with him in the same place. And so it's important for us as we grow in our spiritual understanding of Scripture, sometimes to come back and look at some of these stories because they give us deeper meanings that we will not find in the doctrinal books of the New Testament. These are the things that you know about somebody that will make you say, I may not know the Bible, I may not know the verse, but I know God. I may not know and understand the theology behind all this, but I know the God behind that word. And these are the things that show you the character of God, the faithfulness of God to his word, and the testimonies that we hear from this great crowd of witnesses. These testimonies are the ones that keep a believer going in a journey that sometimes is tough for us to walk in. When Abraham died, these Philistines, the Bible says, they came and brought up the wells he had dug. Who in the world is going to go into a desert place where there is no water, where they have scarcity of water, and brought the places where you can find water? 
What kind of reasoning is this? But this shows you how the devil wants to block the places of refreshment, the places of sustenance, the places of resource. The devil wants to block those places so that when he has blocked the flow and covered it, those who will come later are not going to remember or even know there was sustenance there. He wants the people dwelling in the place now to forget the streams and the flow and the freshness that used to come there. That's why he first puts mud in it, destroys it, and then comes back and covers it and comes back to make sure that there is no sustenance for God's people. The enemy will cover it with that. And so he will start talking about how messy that water is. And he'll come and put some little dirt. Maybe the Philistines came, put in some little dirt in the wells and put more dirt and put more dirt and said, the water is bad. And then convince everybody, let's cover these wells. And they covered and those wells were no longer giving the sustenance in difficult times. And that's what the devil wants to do in people's lives. That the believers that are there today are not going to know where the older generation, the Abrahams and the beginners of our faith, the early church, where did they get their sustenance? Where are the wells? Where they drank from? Because most of this, the enemy has been clogging and covering up and filling with that. And the enemy slowly has been blocking the places where you can find sustenance. And these wells are the ones I pray that God is going to help us so that they can remain open for the generations that are coming. The devil fights with a message of faith. One of those wells for the church. And I'm going to try and explain for the church and also for the individual, for the church. That is a message of faith. The devil wants to come and cover that and muddy that water. And for years it was called the faith message. And it was then called the message of prosperity. And it was called, called uh, and, uh, speak and uh, receive. Or whatever they have nicknamed it. They have given it all kinds of names. But the essence is to destroy what our father Abraham began. Faith that against all hope he continued to hope in God. That is one of the wells that have been destroyed. One of the wells that the enemy is fighting to destroy where it still remains. That we can have church and not have faith. We can have church without the power of God. We can have church without talking about how the word of God can come true in situations that are physically impossible. The message of faith is one of the wells. The message of prayer is another well where the enemy wants people to believe that prayer doesn't change lives. Prayer doesn't change. Fasting doesn't count. Fasting is not needed. These are the wells of the early church. They fasted and prayed. They called on the name of the Lord. The Holy Spirit spoke to them. They prayed until the place where they were shook. It was shaken because they called on the name of the Lord. That this is one of the wells that was built and it was well dug in the early church and it helped and kept people going. They used to meet in groups. They used to meet in houses. They used to meet from house to house and gather in those places where the stronger ones encouraged the weaker ones. The weaker ones brought the fire and the excitement of salvation to those that had actually been in the Lord for a long time. There was revival in the church because this well was well dug in the early church. These are the wells of the early church. These wells need to be redug in our generation. That the coming generation will have an understanding of what faith is. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be filled in the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be healed? How can you be healed by just prayer and, or somebody laying hands on you? These are the words. These are the things that kept the early church alive. And this is what the enemy, through Bible schools, through theological training, through many, many things that we are seeing today, glorious ministries that are empty and dry. This is, and pulpits that are beautiful and colorful, but have no strength behind it, have no word behind it, just some beautifully worded words that seem to be good to the hearing, but are not really the word of the living God. They never challenge the heart. They never challenge the life. They never transform somebody's life. They may sound good. They are, they, are, they are good to the itching ear that the Bible says many will gather for themselves. These are the days where these wells are being covered. And we have wells. We have our own personal wells in this church. We have a well here in the church. And we have dug these wells over the years. Our Sunday service is a well. This is where we gather and we live refreshed. 
This is where we come together when we are going through tough times and God speaks a word to our lives. And this is where we, come, we have come in contact with our miracles. This is where we have come and found genuine friends. This is where we have come and found people that we walk with in the journey of life. They have taught us marriage. They have taught us the things of the spirit. They have taught us the things of life. This is where we have been instructed about finances. This actually is a well. The church is a well, but more so the Sunday morning service is a deep well that the enemy would want to clog up and close down and muddy up and destroy so that it doesn't change people's lives. Our VBS, our kids camp is a well in Kansas City. This is where kids gather. We bring our children so that they can be taught and instructed the word of the Lord. It's been going on for 10 years. Been feeding people's lives. If we give the enemy a chance, he'll clog, clog it up, dirty it and clog it up so that it will be destroyed. But those of you that have come here have always found me here going around with other men and other women of God in this house. And we have securely guarded so that this well is not going to be destroyed by the enemy. Amen. These are wells and I want to show you some of these wells. Our New Year's service is a well. People come here to hear the word of the Lord and that is going to propel them through the following year. This is a well we dug many years ago. This is a well that the enemy was trying to attack. Even the last one we had here. You remember a car came from nowhere. Found past so many of these electric poles. And found just the one that actually matches this section. And hit that one. And that happened just before we began our evening service. It didn't do that during the day. It didn't happen all year. It happened on that evening we were gathering here. Amen. And so that the enemy can stop, but the enemy will never be able to stop. A well that we have dug, we are going to guard those wells. I want you to have an understanding of what you have and what God has given to us. Because if you don't know it, then you will not be able to guard that which you don't understand. Our Friday prayer meetings, like this Friday, is a well. Last year, we dug a new well with a women's conference, unstoppable women's conference. That's a well that is going to feed, refresh, that is going to resource women for generations and for years to come. It's a well that the enemy would want to muddy and dirty up and close down, and he would want that not to happen. The devil would want that not to happen because it's a source of refreshing. It's a source of grace. It's a source of strength. It's a source that gives women hope. That you see all the women that have stood for the faith and for 50 years they have been married. For 30 years they have stood in the faith. For many years they have ministered the gospel. And those images help us and encourage us and tell us keep running and keep going until you get to where you've been called. These are times and this year we are going to dig new wells. The men's conference, the married couples conference that is coming up. It's going to be a well. The 21st. 21 days of fasting that is going to begin in April. That is another well that we have to redig, and that is another well that we have to bring back so that it will be encouraging, energizing, and helping and building up. Our Tuesday fasting and prayer is a well that I pray that the devil is not causing you to eat cereal before the day begins. And then you remember, ouch. Amen. The other personal wells, your dreams have refreshed your life. Your family, your kids is a well that you need to guard. Where you get your daily bread, that is your job, your business is a well. Isaac was using these wells to do irrigation. And when he was doing irrigation, he was doing that so that he can sell crops. He can sustain his own family. So that was his career. That was his job. It was a well. And I want you to know that those wells that you are digging or you have dug in your life, the enemy wants to attack those wells and the enemy wants to come against them. And so I want you to have an understanding that the timid Isaac, the Isaac that married late in life, that he had actually to, had to have a servant go and find him a wife. He could not face a girl. This Isaac is now an older man, stronger man. He has a reason to his place spiritually. He has a walk into his destiny. And now he's starting to dig some wells. And he's saying in his life, I'm an older man, but I need wells in my life for the coming. And he decided I'm going to dig the wells of my father. And this is, he, and this has, there are some three things I want you to know about the digging of wells by the younger generation. 
but by the coming generation. By us. Don't think you're too old. The important lesson is that we have things to learn from the older generation, the Abrahams of our life, that we should never let go. There are things that you, if you think you are it, you have lost. There has to be fathers in your life that speak into your life, that show you the things that actually you need to imbibe in your spirit and in your life so that those things are going to bear fruit, fruit in the future. We need to reopen them for the coming generation. Amen? If we kill prayer, if we kill fasting, if we kill the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if we kill old star preaching and speaking of the word, if we kill these things, the old coming generation has nothing to follow. They have nothing to pursue. These are the things that I pray that we are not going to let go, but we are going to guard. If you have something God has given you, a career, a profession, guard it because that may be the world that your son follows after. That may be something that the next generation is going to come and build to greater strength. That may be something that you want to preserve for the coming generation. And we are told that he called these wells by the names the father had called them. Faith is a well. Baptism is a well. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is a well. This church is a well. The resources you have is a well. Your career is a well. Guard it. Guard those things and keep digging. Don't stop, keep, uh, don't stop digging because God has a plan for your life. Now, he dug and he redug several wells. And I'll just go through them. There are four of them. One of the wells that he redug and he began with this one, he dug and got all the dirt out that the Philistines had put in. And he struck water. And immediately he struck water. The Bible says that they came and argued with him. They quarreled with him. And many, many, this is a level of attack that many people experience. And they give up when you come against this wall. They quarreled. And that word they are used for quarrel, these are just dictionary meanings. An angry, this is an angry argument. Or a disagreement, typically between people who are usually on good terms. It's a squabble, it's a fight, it's a dispute, it's a, it's a, it's a falling out, it's a war of words. So what literally happened by the well, people would come and start shouting with him. That well is not yours, you're a thief, you, you, are, you, are, you came to steal our water. And there was argument that they would say, probably say, where did you come from? You, you have an accent. And they would talk all kinds of things because he was not from there. He was a foreigner in the land. And they argued with him. They were Philistines. He was not. His father had come from the Chaldeans. And now they had a new identity. And they were Hebrews. And so they, this was a different generation. And they had all kinds of names to call him. They argued with him. Many of the wells that we have built, many of the wells the early church had have died because of quarrels and arguments. People come and quarrel and many times the church shies away. Many times the believer shies away. There are those who argue with you at work. And many times when somebody comes and argues with you, with you at work, many of you because of how you want to have, just stay in peace and no quarrels, many times what you do is you start looking for another job somewhere else. How many jobs are you going to do in your lifetime? Many times we are supposed to just have the backbone. We, have, we are supposed to have the strength, chazak, the strength of the spirit that things bounce away from you. That things just bounce off you. When I, I grew up, we used to have uh, some basins. We didn't have showers. And so if you wanted to, <laughs> if you wanted to fetch water, or they, we used to use basins. And some that came from a country that are not mentioned because I still want to stay away from politics, those used to crack the plastics, but there was a particular kind of plastic. We would play soccer with it. We would do all kinds of things. We would bend it, but you put it out in the sun, it would just jump right back. Rubber made. You remember those? They would just jump right back. And your spirit needs to be something like that. That you are not bent and broken by things easily. That actually things can come and crush you and push you. 
But before they know it, you just come and lift up your hands in the church and worship and you are back. And you are, the strength is there and you shoot right back to where you are and you are ready to pursue and you are ready to go on. That you cannot be put down by the arguments that people raise against your life. Quarrels at work. Some, some of you, where you live, your apartment. We used to live in a place where someone da- downstairs used to, I think they used to have a broom that they used to hit the, you know, <laughs> from underneath. And they would hit the ceiling. And we have kids, and, and the kids sometimes are hyper and active. And so whenever they jumped a little bit, and sometimes it wasn't the kid, I assure you. But they would just hit from the, now. It was not intentional. It was not intentional that we were making some noise. But I have to live life. I have to walk. And so I'm not going to move until my contract is done. If you feel like you want to move, please move. But I'm not going to just cower because there is somebody there who doesn't like me. This is where many, many people stop. When you come to Essex, I want to say that this is where many people argue and fight with you. And you do not go out to be offensive or to fight or to be quarrelsome with people. But if others quarrel with you, you need to have a strong spirit and be able to stand in Essex. Because by this war, well, there's going to be argument. When you are new in your career, people try to show you everything. They put you down. They say you are a newcomer. You won't survive long in this business. They try to argue with you about very small things. They cannot even help you with a span to insult you and put you down. Have a spirit that bounces right back. Have a spirit that is strong like bronze, strong like steel, that anything that hits you falls apart, but you remain strong and you cannot be breached by anything that actually comes against your life. You don't throw in the towel just because someone doesn't like you at work or where you park your car or where you do your business. Quarreling against your life, it shouldn't put you away from where God has given you. Some people give up at Essek. But I want to give you strength today. That the Bible says that there is no weapon formed against you that is going to prosper. It says that any weapon that is actually laid against your life. That weapon you have been given a mouth to cast it. You have been given a mouth for vengeance. That you can take vengeance against those. And if it's something that someone has taken from you, you either remove it from uh, under them or you remove them from on top of it. By your mouth, you are able to speak and change things when you stand in Essex. In Essex, where people want to argue against your life and a quarrel against your life, you need to be able to say something and stand your ground still in righteousness, but you need to be able to stand your ground. Many people think Jesus, who was meek and humble, was weak. And Jesus was not a weakling. Jesus was not a weakling. He was a strong. Jesus goes to a market where people sell and buy. You want to play with other people, but don't go play in a market. Market, that's where you find the most vulgar language. That's where people go to make money, make money or die trying. And so they are there. And Jesus goes and takes a whip and turns over the money, uh, changes tables and throws away the doves and whips them. He didn't go with a whip in the spirit. And I'm not suggesting you whip people. But I just want to know, you to know that you, you need to be strong in your spirit. Don't be a weakling and think that you are like Christ. He was the carpenter of his day. And saying that he was the carpenter, what I mean with that is that if you wanted a good table, you went to Jesus the carpenter. He was not a carpenter. He was the carpenter. And carpenters in those days didn't use power saws. They didn't use power machines. They used to cut, go with their donkey, cut a tree, and then tie that to the donkey, and the donkey would draw it right back to the shop. And then they would use their saws. He was a person that was probably very, very strong. Don't have images, but he was strong. Amen? And I want to just suggest that be strong in your spirit. Do not allow quarreling to keep you away from that which God has for your life. Amen? So someone quarreled with you um, about your house, about even on Facebook. Have you seen people who quarrel with others on Facebook? They quarrel with you. They fight. This is your page. They came there. They can unfriend you or just not follow you. 
Then they come to argue with your posts. If you don't like it, move away. But some of you have even stopped posting your verses and scriptures because someone is quarreling with you. Go back to Essek and make sure that there you win the fights that are there. And tell somebody, um, there is a button there. Please, if you don't like what I'm sharing, then it's not yours. Remove yourself. And you can inbox them if you don't want to put them to public shame. Because that may be some food for some people. But let that people not put you away from where God has put you as a resource. Amen. There's another well. He went on and uh, dug another well called Sitna. He called it Sitna. And the reason he called it Sitna is because it's a well. Here they took it another level. It was now not arguments. It was now accusations. It was accusations. Sitna means accusations. False accusations. Hatred is what brings false accusations. The Bible says whosoever gives false witness against his neighbor has hatred in their heart. They started saying, you are this. This is what you did. And they started saying things that he had never done in his life. And so they argued with him. They accused him falsely. But he never stopped digging wells. He just said, well, this one you are fighting about, I'll dig another one. What they were after was for Isaac to be discouraged and to stop digging wells, but he just kept digging. The man could not be discouraged by accusations. And many, many people that have been successful in life are those that have been able to stood in the midst of false accusations and stood their ground. Can you imagine someone like Joseph? who is accused of raping somebody. And this woman had evidence. She had a jacket. Yet Joseph knew that she's the one who wanted to do evil with him. And yet being falsely accused, he still went through it and became the prince of Egypt. That you will come through Sitna, you'll be accused falsely. They will say all manner of things against you, but you should be able to stand as they charge you, as they falsely accuse you, that you can pray for them and you can tell God to bless them and not destroy them. You can still go on, on in, in life. Sitna is another well. He continued digging and found Sitna and found a well. And then he said, you guys are still fighting. And he called. But the, the thing is, even his father had called this well the same name. Because he called them the names his father. That tells you that spiritual warfare has a certain track that it follows. Beersheba, the last one that we read, is the last well. And Beersheba, actually we have a record of it in, 21, uh, in Genesis 21. Beersheba is exactly what the father had called it. And all these other wells we are told, he dug them and called them the names that his father had called them. So they had fought with, um, with Abraham at Essek and quarreled with him. They had accused Abraham falsely in Sitna, and then he moved on and he dug another well in, and called it Rehoboth. And why did he call it Rehoboth? He said, here, they have not fought against me. They seem to be calm. God has now given us room. We are going to prosper. I remember a few weeks ago when we turned over the years, I talked to one pastor and he told me that now, right now I don't have fights. Right now, it's nice. Right now, it's going well. And I told him, this is now the time you can grow. This is when now you can expand. This is, those who oppose him, he said, those who oppose me now are no longer in opposition. And I said, this is when now you can grow. This is when now you can, you can call it the Hobart season of your life. And I want you to know, one of my friends, old time, old time friend, he had a church in one of the cities near the town I grew up in, and he, he had called the ministry Rehoboth Ministries. This is a time where you get to the place where God opens a door for your life, and you get married. And now there is peace. Those who are fighting with you during the wedding, after they ate the cake, God shut their mouths. They are now home. You have a season now for you and your spouse to expand and grow. And you're saying, now God has given me room. Now I can grow. Some of you have struggled through school and you graduated. And now you have a job and this is Rehoboth for your life. When you have come through and you have come to this place in Rehoboth, this is a time of growth and expansion in your life. This is a time to grow, go out. And the, the, uh, Rehoboth means enlargement. 
It's a, it's a place for enlargement and growth. And you need to know the season that you are in your life. And when you know that season, don't, don't continue in fighting mode when you are married. Yes. Don't start poking people and telling people they are looking at your husband. And you're already married. You have the ring. Yes. The guy cannot even see. And you're still fighting other people. You are in a different season. Yes. There are people who have moved from Sitna. You have moved from Essex. You are in Rehoboth. And you are still fighting battles that you have no business fighting. God has given you room now. Go and expand and grow in your family. Amen? Amen? Don't fight with the younger girls. I'll go back there. Lady, I'll go back there. You're married. Move on in life. You have somebody. Leave us in the field. Move on. That's what the younger generation is saying to you. And you're still looking at them and saying, why is so and so? And you're always on their Facebook. What are you doing in their Facebooks? Amen? Amen? <laughs> May God help some of you. You went to school. You are now a nurse. And you still want to fight with everybody who is in the floor. Now actually, now that God blessed you, you want to use the blessing as a hammer. To hammer those you are working with there. God has, let us Rehoboth, expand. Go into those offices and talk to the admin and ask, ask them, how do, does someone get promoted here? Find out. Don't go back to the floor. Pray for those that are back there. Help them. Fight for their case. Don't fight with those whom you shouldn't be fighting. Some of you, you have every paper that is needed for you to be comfortable in this country. And you are still hunt, hunting down where ice is following people. Leave people alone. Leave those that are trusting God. Let them continue trusting God. Don't make a mockery of them. You have settled. You have everything. You have Rehoboth. Find jobs. And go to school. That's your business. Right now, you have everything you need. Now, expand in the land. And leave other people alone. Go into the season where you belong. If you're a parent, parent your children. Leave those that are single alone. Let them wait. You don't be in all their businesses. Go to the next level. I'm looking for words and I'm, you can tell I'm really struggling. <laughs> I'm really struggling. I'm looking for the right words to say. And I'm really struggling because there's a message that is burning in my heart. Many of you have come to Rehoboth, but your eyes are still in Sitna. And some of your eyes are still in Essek. You are fighting tiny, minim, minimalistic things that you shouldn't even be considering in your life. You are majoring on the minors. You are sweating the small stuff. You are destroying your own life by not understanding your season. And sons of Issachar, the Bible talks about the sons of Issachar in the, among the children of Israel. They were wise. And the children of Dan, they were wise. They understood the times. They knew the times. And so if you wanted to understand the times, you went to them and talked to the children of Dan and the children of Issachar. And you asked them about the times. They knew about the times. What is your understanding of the season that you are in your life? If you are where I am, you are seeing the top of the mountain. It's not too far from you. And there, so there are things that you shouldn't be fighting. There are things that you shouldn't be doing. That, because you are at another stage and at another level. Those of us that have come to this place, that have an understanding that this is where God has given you room to exercise the faith you have been taught. Grow and expand as much as you can. Exercise the faith. Take the word of God and run with it. Take a word and say, this word this year, I wanted to see it come in my life. This is part of my inheritance. I want to see it come into my life. The Bible says that the blessing of the Holy Spirit is mine and my children. I want to see it happen in my life. And if you have the blessing of the Holy Spirit in your own life, you want to see it in the children, in your children's life. And they can talk to you and can say to you about the life of someone walking in the Spirit. And that is what you need to fight. And that is where you need to have your life settled. Rehoboth means expansion. Rehoboth means peace. Rehoboth means I have room now, I can grow. Rehoboth means the fighting here is 
actually done, I can expand and grow. Thank God for those of you that are still fighting in Sydney and those in Essex. Keep fighting, keep going forward. And those of you that are in Rehoboth, keep expanding and growing. But I want to say something about Rehoboth and I want to take it further. I know I've talked about Rehoboth before, but I want to take it just one step further because I know you can hold it. The worst level of spiritual fighting is the battle in Rehoboth where there is peace. Many people think that Rehoboth, the devil gave up, put down the weapons and he stopped fighting because he has given up. But this is the enemy, the fighter at his best. He will leave you alone. He will leave you to think that the fight is over so you can settle in Rehoboth. He knows that he cannot stop you from succeeding, but he can limit you by you thinking that this is all that God has for my life. I need to stop digging wells because I'm where I have settled. So that's why you find many people that have been married are settled. They cannot serve. They don't pray. They don't go anywhere. They will not do anything. They are settled and the devil says, now you are done. Just settle. Don't talk to people after service. Take your husband and go to the car. Take your wife and go to the car and go home. You are settled. And the devil has handed a form of Christianity that tells people that is all you had come to Christ for. You are settled. Stay at Rehoboth. Don't go beyond this place. This is where you need to settle. And many people have settled there. Many people have just their business open. They are open for business. They are not making profits or losses. They are just there. And just because they are open, they think that this is all that God has for me. They are in Rehoboth. They are not digging any more wells. Some people actually that have little, someone said little knowledge is very dangerous. They have gone and they have a certificate, a diploma, and they cannot allow anyone else to speak. Because now they have a diploma and uh, so life is good. The devil says this is Rehoboth, settle down, this is all you can do. Settle down how many people are like you. And he doesn't show you the people ahead of you, he shows you those that are behind you. So Rehoboth is a trap. Rehoboth can be one of your biggest challenges in life. And I want to challenge many of you that are settled in Rehoboth. That is not what all that God has for your life. God did not just say that you're going to just settle here and stay here. The Bible talks about Isaac having settled and seen the peace. He knew that this is not all God has. He knew Abraham had gone beyond this. And so he moved. And the Bible says he now came to this other place. And when he came here, he actually started digging wells. And I want to read it again. The Bible says here in, um, in verse 24. Verse 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, so you see, the day he moved, the day he was comfortable, he was doing okay, he was settled, the day he decided, this is good, but I'm going to move from here and go to the next level, that is the day God spoke to him. God loves faith. God loves to see someone who says, I know this is good, I know some people who would cry for what I have now, but I know my God can do more. My God is greater. My God is more powerful. My God is more able. My God doesn't mean survival for me. My God means abundance for my life. And so they pursue a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. They are not settled with survival. And so they give glory to the name of our God. And so... He actually saw that he was not going to settle there when he moved. That night, God spoke to him. And God say, seems to say, I now see you are wise. You have passed the test of success. The test of opposition, people pass easy. We know how to survive through problems. The test of success is the hardest for many people. When you are succeeding and doing well, many people settle for that. The good thing you have is the enemy of the best, they have said. That you, when you are doing a little better than almost everybody else, you stand a chance that you're not go, going to go beyond that. But I refuse that in the name of Jesus. And I pray that those of you that are in Rehoboth are going to arise and go to Beersheba. And you are going to hear the voice of the Lord again reassure you and say that I am your God. And I will be with you. Do not fear. I'm going to stand with you. 
And that word tells you that even in the midst of voices and noises that are being spoken every day, that God is going to be with you. He says, do not fear. That means settle in this land. Start digging again. Because in this land, I'm going to bless you. Uh, he knew the Philistines would come like they had come before. He knew that they were going, going to come and challenge him again in Beersheba. But he actually had the voice of God and God said, I will bless you and multiply your descendants for, this, for my servant's sake and for Abraham's sake. And so the challenge that is there for each one of us is to make sure that we hear the voice of God as we move out of our settling in Rehoboth, that we hear the voice of God taking us to the next level. If you turn again to verse 26, Genesis 26, 26, in Geral of Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Fikol, the commander of his army, and Isaac, said to them, why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. Amen? It's in Beersheba that the enemy actually comes and, and makes a treaty. And comes and says, now I know God is with you. Now I know you are blessed by God. And initially they are the ones that were saying, you are just trying. God is not with you. There is no God. This, all these things are fake. The promises of Abraham, he died without the fullness. And so they were coming and saying and rehearsing all these things uh, to Isaac before. But now this time, they saw something new. And they came and they made a treaty. And they said, we now know God is with you. It is when you move beyond the place of settling. It is when you are motivated by faith to move to the next level. That is when actually even the enemy acknowledges that God is with you. Many of you that have begun to see success in your life, do not settle there. Many of you that are starting to see the hand of God, do not settle there. Don't let success stop you. You have to keep digging and keep digging and keep digging. New wells, new wells, the old wells being guarded, but you are digging new wells until you hear the voice of God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Until that voice is heard in my ears, I'm going to continue to strive. I'm going to continue to be diligent. Many hours I'll struggle and make sure that I do the best I can for the Lord. Amen. And this is the voice that I pray that many of us will hear. It's at Beersheba. The Bible says that God spoke to Isaac and he said, I am your God. I'll fight for you. Those who fight against you, I will fight for you. Do not fear them. And he says, I will bless you. And he repeats the promises that he had given to Abraham and that place. The Bible says that when these people left, because they had come and made a treaty with him when they left, the Bible says that same night, his servants came and told him, we have found water. And he said, this is Sheba. Sheba is uh, where we have the word seven. The well of sevens. If you look in the Bible where they have a notation at the bottom, you'll see it's called the well of sevens. It's completion. It is the completion of all things. It is when you do that which God called you to do. Until when prophets lay hands on you, they have no more work for you. Like in Paul's day, they, Paul said, I have run the race. I have fought the fight. And he, say, see, he says, there's nothing else for me to do. I now see a crown that is laid before me. He had done everything. He had fought the good fight and finished. And until we get there, we will keep fighting. Until we get there, we will keep going forward. If your marriage is still at Essex, there's still some quarreling in the marriage. And even if it's gone up to another level, it's now serious arguments and fightings. Do not stop there. If your marriage is as Rehoboth, keep going forward. Keep digging new wells for your marriage until your marriage has hit where God will say, this is my son. I love this because it's an example of what a marriage ought to be and what ought to be seen in a married person's life. Amen.